this next illustration on scraper board this time um, is utterly different. Anybody recognize this? No, no. Yeah? BB, that's right, yeah, the little gray men. BB was the pseudonym of a writer and artist called Dennis Watkins Pitchford. Um, and through this book and others, I came to know and love that part of my outlying regions where the last gnomes in England live. BB was one of the great writers about nature in children's books. In Brendan Chase, for example, his descriptions of the woodland where the heroes spend a summer living wide are intensely lyrical, beautiful, extraordinary writing. In some ways, he was a limited writer. There are many things he can't do. But the honesty and passion with which he talks about wild things and wild places suffuses his best passages with a love of landscape, and especially English landscape, which is irresistible. And I was beginning to see, as I prepared this talk, something about my particular borderland, which might not be true of every reader. It probably isn't. One more example of the sort of thing I respond to very strongly is, well, you know who this is. This is, uh, this is Rupert. Uh, and it's one of Alfred Bestall's pages. Now, Bestall didn't originate Rupert. He was created in the um, 1930s by a woman called Mary Tortell, who didn't do him for very long. Bestall soon took over, and quite soon he established a formula for the page of the Rupert Annual. That's where most of us read them, I guess. He was in the Daily Express, but if you didn't um, get the Daily Express, uh, you wouldn't have seen the Daily Rupert. Instead, uh, there was a Rupert Annual every Christmas. And... They were, every page was like this. And I don't know if it had occurred to you, but there are, there are not two ways or three ways. There are actually five ways of telling the story on this page, on every page. First of all, there are the pictures, which are it's central and they're important, right there in the middle. And they're colored, they're beautifully drawn, beautifully printed. So the, 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 the whole thing revolves around the pictures. And then there's a little verse under the, under the picture. And then at the bottom of the page, there's the prose. Um, I know a, a friend of mine, professor of English at a different university from this, who claims that she used to choose her friends by whether they read the verse first or the prose first <laughs> in the Rupert books. Uh, I can't remember which one was the approved one, but um, it carried, carried a great significance for her. One interesting little detail is that both the prose and the verse are in the present tense. Now, that's important because pictures, of course, are always in the present tense. Pictures only have a present tense. You can't show what has happened in a picture. Uh, you show what's happening now. And the fact that the, the words defer to the pictures in this sense um, is another tribute to their centrality, the centrality of the pictures. So there are three ways, pictures, verse, and prose. But there are two other ways on every page. First of all, there's the headline, Rupert bows to the king, and that's different on every page as well. It says what happens. And then last of all, there are two little figures on either side of the headline. One of them is always Rupert, and the other is always an important figure from the story, the whistlefish, Rupert and the whistlefish. But as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm, what I'm going to talk about here is the, the landscape. That was what had me hooked. His landscapes were marvellous. At the end, papers of every Rupert annual were, were a sort of fairy landscape with, with you know, wonderful Chinese um, pagodas and... Um, all sorts of interesting bits of forest and strange things happening. And here, we, in the bottom right-hand picture, those strange constructions in the bottom of the sea, what are they? Well, they're prison cells, actually. Each of them contains a prisoner. And Rupert's going to go and set someone free. Bestall was full of a fancy. I'm sure that's the word for the special quality of lightness and delicacy and charm that his landscapes uh, and his stories embody. He was a great, um, a great champion. But as I was thinking, as I say, about this borderland business and wondering which pictures to show you and talk about, I found that there were some children's books which, for all their great quality, for all the great quality of their illustrations, aren't interested in landscape at all. All the pictures we've seen so far are. I didn't like those pictures any less, or indeed love them any less. It's just that they were different. For example, this one. I love the caption here. <laughs> 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 
Richmond Crompton's William, whose literary life, in the course of which he, he grew not, not a day older, <laughs> lasted even longer than Rupert's from the early 20s right up to sometime after the war. And he was drawn from the beginning by Thomas Henry. And it's this scruffy, muddy-kneed schoolboy who is our image of William still and always. And while Thomas Henry, like the author Richmond Crompton, was very interested in human beings and delighted to represent the various comic types, both child and adult, who impinged on the life of, of William and the outlaws, and they're full of those. People, the, the village was always being, there was somebody taking it, you know, coming to live in the village or staying there for, it was an artist or, or a spy or someone you, interesting like that, and uh, William would want to you know, go and be like them and interfere with them. But the backgrounds against which they're sketched and against which the stories are set are pretty rudimentarily sketched. We seldom have any sense of a real place full of its own atmosphere, its own intense and pungent personality, like Richard Kennedy's Paris or Arthur Ransom's Lakeland. Someone apparently um, once who had time on their hands and nothing better to do once tried to work out from the content of the William books where they were set. So they drew up complicated charts and worked out how long it would take Mr. Brown to get home. And he went up to London every day on the train. And what time he got home and looked at the train time tables and went through the number, the number, kinds of different shops there were in the village and so on. And worked out finally, eventually, in triumph, that William lived in Bicester. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> Believe it or not, I don't know. It doesn't seem very likely to me, but it could be anywhere, really. I had the sense of somewhere sort of Surrey or Hampshire way, I don't know, or, 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 or Gerard's Cross or something like that. It's just generic middle-class England. Crompton just wasn't that interested in landscape, and nor are her stories, and neither was Thomas Henry, and it doesn't matter, but it's true. Another great favourite of mine, and very much part of my borderland, and equally not really interested in landscape, is... Uh, this. Does anybody know what this comes from? Um, one or two people might recognise the style of illustration. It's from Emil and the Detectives, that uh, wonderful novel by Erich Kästner, published in about, again, about 1930. Set, of course, very firmly in Berlin. But you wouldn't really know that from these wonderful drawings by Walter Trier. I've spoken about line before, about um, Kennedy's line and Wegner's line and Janssen's line. Well, Walter Trier's line is immediately recognisable as his and wonderfully fluid and expressive. But they could be standing anywhere, these boys. There's no background at all. And in the next picture, the room they're in is completely invisible. They could be in Arizona. They could be on the moon. But just look at those lines. Look at those parallel lines, especially. What economy. What versatility, what elegance and wit, how they all rhyme with one another. Here they, they represent the children's hair. There they're the curve around the side of the jug of chocolate. Somewhere else they're the struts in the back of the chairs. And down below they're the shadow under the table. Just quick lines, quick parallel lines to do all that. And every single figure is characterised differently. And he's got ten of them. Ten. All sitting around a single table. And a cake. Genius. That's what genius looks like. One more from Emil. Just look at these journalists, each one a complete individual. See how cleverly he's arranged them in the space, leading the eye from Emil back to the editor at his desk, cigar in hand. See how the room is suggested with the barest of means, the, the desk lamp, the suggestion of some kind of telephone, teleprinter or typewriter or something, it doesn't matter because suggestion is all we need here to evoke the busy and important life of a great modern newspaper, modern for 1930, of course. But for Walter Trier and his illustrations for Emil, just as for Thomas Henry and his pictures for William, the landscape wasn't interesting for its own sake. It was a place for something to happen in. It might as well have been a stage set. The interest of these stories, it was then and still is, and not in the spaces they depict, the places, but in the people who move and act and talk in them. The little town of Bicester might as well have been um, Andover or Basingstoke. The big city of Berlin might as well have been Vienna or Amsterdam. The work of Arthur Ransom, on the other hand, is quite inconceivable without its very specific and particular setting in the Lake District, the lakes, the fells, those great silent hills that he loved so much, or else in the other part of the landscape, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the Norfolk Broads, in East Anglia. And I wonder whether there's a, a genuine difference here between two kinds of writer, 
two kinds of illustrator, two kinds of children's book. For one kind, action and character are the important things, and the setting is more or less incidental. For the other kind, setting and landscape are absolutely integral to the kind of story they want to tell, to the only kind of story they can tell. I think C.S. Lewis was talking about something like this when he described two kinds of readers, the one who cared only for the action and the suspense and didn't care in the least whether the story was set in Camelot or on Mars or in Los Angeles, and the one like himself for whom such things as snowshoes and deep forests and Hiawatha sort of names were an essential part of the pleasure. I couldn't find the essay in which he said this, so I'd quote his exact words, but that was the gist of it, and I'm completely with him on the matter. And as for the difference between one sort of book and another, whether it's a, a deep difference or a superficial one, I couldn't say, nor could I say whether it matters very much. It matters to me because I'm interested in it, but that's all I can claim. Thank you.